We should be looking at Exodus chapter 34 uh, and a passage which is probably unique in the whole of Scripture. But before I get on to that and read it, I just wanted to quote something. It was out of a psychology journal, Psychology Today, and published in 2021. And it said this, anthropologists estimate that at least 18,000 different gods, goddesses, and various animals or objects have been worshipped by humans since our species first appeared. Today it's estimated that more than 80% of the globe population considers themselves religious or spiritual in some form. And from that, I would deduce this, that we are hardwired as human beings to seek after one outside of ourselves. We have a God consciousness in here, and people are seeking him, whether it's gods in a jungle, or whether it's sophisticated people seeking answers to life's problems. And it's into that comes this wonderful book called the Bible, which is a revelation of God from the beginning, in the beginning God, right through to Revelation, when the end of all things is talked about, and eternity. And throughout, there's an amazing, amazing narrative of God's work, not only in, 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 in creation, but also in salvation of a sinful people to himself. It's a wonderful book. And out of that, we're simply going to look at Exodus 34, and I'm going to read these amazing verses, because we are exploring revelation. We're exploring what God has revealed. We believe that God exists, and God is complete in himself, but he has made a revelation. He's given us something that we can learn about concerning his person and his work. Now, I'm just going to read these, read these verses from Exodus 34, and then I'll put them in context in just a moment. Moses is up on the mountain. He is conversing with God, and he's asked God to show him his glory. And we read this. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. I just want to say something about the importance of names. When we talk about the character of God, we're talking about the character and the names that God has revealed concerning himself. But I just want to say something about names. Names are very important. Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, God gave them the task of naming the animals. So that when you saw a long four-legged beast with a great long neck, you could call it a giraffe. So when you mention a word giraffe, everybody from the age of 8 to 80 knows what they're in and they can attempt to draw it. So names are important. They identify the object that is named. An angel came to a pregnant, uh, well, she wasn't pregnant at that time, but to Mary and said, you, Mary, you're going to be pregnant. And the baby, the child, you will call his name Jesus. So the name of that baby that's going to be born to Mary was very important. He was going to save his people from their sins. And a little later on, Paul in Philippians 2.9 said about Jesus, this Jesus who grew up and gave his life, died on the cross. He says this, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. So the name of Jesus was exalted after his triumph on the cross. Names are important. But there's a particular significance about names in the Jewish culture. And of course, this is essentially, in a sense, a, a Jewish book <laughs> written by Jews about Jews. It obviously has relevance to all Christians because there's no difference between Christ and between Jew and Greek now. But it is a Jewish book, and the importance of names is particularly relevant. I quoted this from, from the Jewish Chronicle. It says, a Hebrew name identifies you with your culture. It reminds you that you have your own culture and essence. 
to the Hebrew, the name is a shorthand for character. So names are important. So we're looking at this, and there's something about the passage we've just read and the <clears throat> little bit around the, the bit in, in, in Exodus 34, which tells about God is, is revealing himself in a particular way. I've got two narratives now that I want to give you. The first narrative is a little bit earlier than the passage we've read in Exodus 34, and it's about Moses earlier on. <clears throat> you read a bit in, in Exodus chapter 3. Now, Moses has been brought up in Egypt. He's now had to flee to Midian because he killed an Egyptian. And he's really in a bit of a state. He's wandering in the wilderness, and he finds a bush burning, but it doesn't get consumed. I'm sure you remember the story. And there God meets with him. And this is rather a unique situation. He's obviously, in time before, he's, he's led Abraham. He's done all sorts of things with people, but now he's getting personal. He's actually speaking with Moses and he's commissioning him to go back to Pharaoh and to deliver his people who are in captivity and have been for several hundred years. And he says in Exodus 3.12, I will be with you. And Moses he says, well, how are, how are these Israelites going to know that I've, I've got authority? So God gives him a name and he says, I am has sent you. I am Yahweh. I am what I am. Or it can be translated, I will be what I will be. Now suddenly, this is the first time it has happened. God has come to a person, a human being, and he's given him his name. So important, I am that I am. God is complete in himself. God is perfect. He's perfectly trustworthy. He's consistent, he's consistent in his authority and his power. God is completely perfect in all his ways. I am that I am. Nothing outside of him. He is perfection. And he said, this I am will be with you. It's an amazing revelation that Moses has. Now, why right on for a few years, a few decades, Narrative number two, children of Israel have come out of Israel, out of Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, miraculous, miracle upon miracle, and yet they're a rebellious people, they moan, they're in the wilderness, they're unbelieving, and Moses has gone up into the mountain to receive the law, and as he receives the law on the tablets of stone, what's going on below? The people are saying to Aaron... Well, Moses is gone. Don't know where he is. We want a God. All these other tribes have gods. They can see them. They can worship. We want a God like that. So Aaron makes a golden calf out of their trinkets and gold jewelry, and they start worshiping. And God is aware of this, and he is angry. And he says to Moses, he says, look, I'll get rid of these people. I'll make a, I'll make a, a nation of you. <clears throat> Moses intercedes on, God's, on Israel's behalf before God. So that is the background. And Moses is in the mountain at the moment. And he says, God, I want to see your glory. He's been communing with God. And he says, I want to see your glory. And Moses says, God says rather in Exodus 33, 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In other words, the promise, this personalization of God to Moses, this wonderful relationship that God has with Moses. And Moses says, I will go with you. Moses says, look, I can't leave this people unless you're with me. God says, I will go with you. But then he accedes to Moses' requests, and he says, look, you can't look on my glory. I'll hide you in the cleft of a rock. And you, can, you, you can see my hind parts, as it were, as I go by. And there's this, it's almost difficult, impossible, you can describe this, this, this event. You can't replicate it. Nobody could, you know, Cecil DeMille or whoever it might have been, the film director who makes a great film of these epics, he might try, but nobody could represent this. Here's Moses, hidden in the cleft of a rock, and God passes by him. He not only parades himself, 
but he tells Moses who he is. He unpacks the name Yahweh, and he talks, and look at the terms in which, which he uses here. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. This is God revealing himself. This is God telling Moses who he is. It's not just a human being trying to imagine what God is like. This is God saying, this is who I am. But he goes on to say, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bows the ground at once and worshipped. So here is God revealing himself. His glory is his character. You often wonder what the glory of God is, don't you? Is it light? What does it look like? Well, essentially, it's who he is. And God is glorious. Now, over the next few weeks, we will be unpacking some of these um, truths that Moses had revealed to him what they actually mean to us. But I want to think particularly this morning of the, the holiness and the justice of God. Because there is a little bit, or for some of us, a little bit of a problem here. We're quite happy with this first bit about the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's wonderful. We can, we can identify with that. But it's what Moses, what God goes on to say to Moses, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And there enters into our thinking, perhaps, I think, well, I'm not sure about this. I, it worries me. Does this suggest a vindictive God has got, has got, got an aspect where he, he is vindictive? You know, this, the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, this sounds... This sounds to our way of thinking rather, rather cruel, rather vindictive. And we do have difficulties. You know, we, we're conscious, aren't we, of, of, of many uh, sad families where there's violence and abuse and a wife can suddenly find that she's, she's having terrible abuse and so forth and her friends are around and say this man, well, he's lovely, he's, he's wonderful. He's such a gentle person. Ah, but she says, you see what he's like when he's indoors. There's another side to him. Do you know that we often say to people, you know, there's another side to them. You see a lovely side, but I see something different. And we can almost, if we're not careful, think that about God. God said, well, he's loving and glorious, but is there another side to him? This anger against sin, this, this punishment and so forth, it seems another, another side. Now, what I want to convey this morning and seek to, 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 to dispel this thought, there isn't another side to God. God is all glorious. There's no other side to him. But you cannot, I suggest to you, conceive of a God who represents himself in these ways without realizing that he has to have wrath against sin. He cannot, he cannot abide sin. Wickedness has to be punished. He couldn't be a perfect God and overlook sin. Now that is, in a sense, in our way of thinking, a self-evident truth in this sense that you can't understand the crucifixion unless you realize that God has anger against sin and yet he is glorious and perfect and holy at the same time. He's not got another side that is part of his perfection. And understanding this, you know, after we've just had communion, we've just had a bit of bread and we've had a little drink of wine, and we've remembered that Jesus was crucified. Why? Well, he endured the wrath of God against sin. His vision was marred more than any man. Why? Well, because God's anger was dissipated in Christ so that we might go free. God is complete. Wayne Grudem has something, Wayne Grudem wrote a, a systematic theology, and he had a very helpful way of putting this. 
if it still sort of sticks in your mind, this idea of God. And, you know, I just don't feel comfortable with the way he's portrayed here. He said this, some might want to stop short at this point. In other words, when he says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. But he says, but we should remember that this too is scripture and is written for our edification. This statement shows the horrible nature of sin in the way that it effect, has effects far beyond the individual sinner, also harming those around the sinner and harming future generations as well. In other words, it's sin that has this corrosive effect on the person, on the family, on generations. It, 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 it's, it's horrible. Sin is, is appalling. This is why God is implacably opposed to sin. He cannot exist alongside sin. Sin will eventually be eradicated. Satan will be destroyed. Glory and honor and perfection will remain. That is God's purpose, and that is what God is working towards. Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. So he is not a vengeful God. 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter says this, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everybody to come to repentance. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. Not willing that any should perish, but everybody comes to to repentance. Now this character of God, this beauty, this glory, this the gracious and compassionate God is going to have purpose. He says to Moses, I will go with you. So it's first of all seen in the release of captive people from Egypt through the, through the uh, miracles that, that were performed. He comes through, there's the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea and the Israelites are brought and eventually, and their unbelief means that there are 40 years in the wilderness, but eventually they come into the promised land. God has purpose, and in spite of all the things that go wrong with Israel, he still brings them into the promised land. God's purposes are immutable. So I think it's important to this, that there are no lingering doubts or wrong notions of what God is like. He is our heavenly Father. You know, sometimes people can say, you know, well, I, I, can, I, can, I can cope with Jesus, I love Jesus, but God the Father, I, I feel in a sense rather frightened of him. You know, he has this sort of feel about him and I, I'm not sure. Well, in what I've been trying to say to you this morning, I hope you see the glory and the beauty of God. The wonderful thing is that the Holy Spirit who's been shed abroad in our lives now through Christ, his great joy is to, is to exalt Christ. And as we exalt Christ, the Holy Spirit is, 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 is pleased. He's, that, that's his aim, to glorify Christ. That even the death of Christ is to bring us back into relationship with the Father. The Father, Holy Spirit, and, and Jesus are all one. They're part of the Trinity. And this is what God is doing. He, he, he sent Christ so that we can be brought back into relationship with our Heavenly Father who is glorious and perfect, full of compassion, loving us. He is, he is not to be feared, he is to be revered and to be honored and loved as he loves us. That's God's purpose. Now looking at the, the character of God, um, we've seen it in, in particular in this, as I say, extraordinary passage of, of, of in, in Exodus chapter 34, there's nothing like it in the whole of Scripture where God goes before Moses and portrays and demonstrates his character and who he is. But for the Old Testament, the name Yahweh will mean all that the name Jesus means in the New Testament. All right, so in the Old Testament, you have Yahweh. Lots of prophetic words about the Messiah. But in the New Testament, we have Jesus and the two are parallel, and in many senses they're the same God manifesting in different dispensations. Why is that? Well, it's clear, Jesus made it clear. He was talking to the Pharisees at one stage and they were arguing with him. 
And he says in John 8, verse 38, he says this, Verily, verily, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And in other words, this term Yahweh, Jesus, appropriates to himself. He says, I am. And of course, at that point, the Jews picked up stones to throw at him because they thought he was blaspheming. To them, Yahweh was God. And who was this man, this, this, this man who was standing before them? He was just a human being. Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And on that later occasion when John was um, imprisoned on the island of Patmos and he had the vision of Jesus and wrote the book that we understand as the book of Revelation, he said he had a, a, a vision of Jesus. He said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is the express image of God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So we see the character of God, all these attributes that he parades before Moses, we see in the person of the Lord Jesus. And I'm sure many of us this morning, perhaps almost all of us, have experienced that in our own lives. We've come to know Jesus, not just as a person out there, not just as a character in the Bible, but a living reality who comes into our lives and transforms us. And we learn about God the Father through the person of the Lord Jesus. The one who said to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There you see all the character of God, the compassion, the graciousness the slow to anger, abundant, abounding in love and faithfulness and maintaining love. You see that in that sentence that God said, you know, come to me, says Jesus. All you who are feeling the heat of the day, I will give you rest. That's what Jesus does in our lives. He brings us joy, hope, peace in the midst of all the turmoils of, of life that we experience. That's who Jesus is. And that is something of the character of God. I hope it releases you. Do you know, when I was preparing this, I, I became, I wouldn't say exactly overwhelmed, but the, the, the whole theme of the character of God is so great, so glorious. I thought, how can one possibly expound this, God? How can I ever do justice to us? And... I just wrote these words down because they, they came to me quite clearly, I felt from God. And he said this, cut the ropes of skepticism, unbelief and doubt, soar with me into the heights of my glory, and I will show you my character as I showed Moses. Only have faith and believe. Understanding it is hard for your finite minds, but as you experience my love and delight in you, the more that understanding will deepen and enrich your soul. And I, I just felt that came to me, and I had to share it with you because it, 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 it sort of formed the crux of what I was wanting to, to share this morning and what I wanted to lead us into, that we, we lay aside all the, di the difficulties and the unbeliefs and the doubts we have, and we, in a sense, soar into the heights of God's glory. <laughs> that wonderful old chorus that we sang, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I believe over the next few weeks, as we look at these characters of God in, in more, more detail, that he wants to speak to us. He wants to enrich us. Because we, why? <laughs> well, for this reason, that all the length of time, however long it is that we have on this earth, before God calls us to glory is that we want to be, well, Paul calls them living letters, living epistles. We want to be those who 
who spread the good news of Jesus, basically, <laughs> by who we are, by what we say, commending Jesus to other people. That's what we're here for. We're here to express and extend the kingdom of God. We're here to be, to be Jesus in the world. And how much the world desperately needs Jesus. And we can moan about the world, we can look at the state, but God said the kingdom of God is, is going to grow, it's going to develop, it's going to grow. And in spite of all the horrible things that are happening in the world, the kingdom of God is growing. It is growing in all sorts of different areas. I was talking to my friend just a little while ago from Sazra, the Soldiers and Armors Scripture Readers Association, who he was telling me some of the amazing stories of how many soldiers are coming to Christ. And it's exciting. I've got involved with these student unions and Christian unions, and it's exciting on campuses and the universities how many students are coming to faith in Christ and how Christians are finding all sorts of innovative ways of witnessing to Jesus on the campus. It's, it's the kingdom of God is growing, it's extending, but it's extending through us. We are God's agents on earth that he wants to use. So we need to have, and I do, I just want to go back to that business about how we view God and that we don't view that God has another side to him, but we view God as a whole, his beautiful perfection not only his glorious compassion and his forgiveness of sins, but also in the wrath that he has against sin. We must learn to hate sin, not the sinner. We must learn to hate sin as God does. I think I've just about finished now, but I just wanted us to, to worship a bit. I don't know, can you, can you play that song for us? <laughs> oh, lovely. I just wanted to, to end up with, with just an act of worship and, and sing that song, You Are Beautiful Beyond Description, because um, I just feel it expresses something of what I've been trying to say this morning, and he is beautiful beyond description. <laughs> he is too wonderful for words. And I think I'm just going to pray as we just conclude our worship this morning and sing this, that just... The Holy Spirit will just come afresh into us and bring the, the character of God afresh in our hearts. He is such a wonderful God to serve. Yeah. Can we just all stand? Mm -hmm.